My mum always used to tell me, Luke, people died for your right to vote. And I always thought, yeah, sure, it was probably this one time long ago. Well, actually, more recently than I realised, people in Britain really did lose their lives fighting for the vote. Without the deaths of those people, I wouldn't have the privilege today. Okay, mum, I've stopped taking it for granted now. I'm Luke Pierce, and this is the Radical History Channel, where we bring to light the people throughout history who risked everything for the social, economic, and democratic rights we enjoy today. In the early part of the 19th century, in a major British city, a group of people came together to challenge a rotten voting system that helped the privileged at the expense of everyone else and met with the panicked, lethal overreaction of that privileged elite. The ensuing massacre revealed the lengths to which those in power will go in order to dispel threats to their power. But in the case of Peterloo, the effect was the reverse of what the politicians intended, because by killing the protesters, they opened the gates to democracy. Today, Manchester is a thriving city in the northwest of England with a population of more than half a million people. It's represented by five members of parliament. In 1819, Manchester had 60,000 inhabitants and no members of parliament directly represented the city. In fact, the whole county of Lancashire was just represented by two MPs. Of the million people who lived in Lancashire at the time, only 17,000 had the right to vote. This imbalance between voters and the parliamentary representation affected all of Britain. In 1791, Political activist Thomas Paine wrote, The county of Yorkshire, which contains near a million souls, sends two county members, and so does the county of Rutland, which contains not a hundredth part of that number. The town of Old Sarum, which contains not three houses, sends two members, and the town of Manchester, which contains upwards of 60,000 souls, is not admitted to send any. Is there any principle in these things? The British system was in urgent need of reform, but that didn't suit members of Parliament who wanted to keep their voters under control. You can't do that when everyone has a say, you'd have to start doing things that were popular. The political atmosphere in Britain was already tense. In that same year that Thomas Paine was writing Rights of Man, revolutionaries in neighbouring France had upended their political system by decapitating those at the top. Only eight years before that, the United States had won independence from Britain in the American Revolutionary War. In Britain, the powers that were, were nervous. There's Prime Minister Robert Jenkinson looking very nervous the citizens of Manchester were suffering. There was high unemployment after the war with Napoleon. The price of bread was soaring thanks to the Corn Laws. People were poor, starving and had little to occupy them. They believed in a political solution to their problems if only they had the power. In 1817, delegates from across the country organised a petition which was presented to the House of Commons by radical Whig MP Thomas Cochrane. Outside Parliament, a crowd of radicals led by Henry Hunt cheered as the petition asserted that your honourable house doth not in any constitutional or rational sense represent the nation, that when the people have ceased to be represented, the constitution is subverted, that taxation without representation is a state of slavery. Parliament ignored the petition. They hoped the petitioners' grievances would go away. They didn't. Half the total population of Manchester had signed the petition and they'd been ignored. In 1819, the Manchester Patriotic Union was formed with the express intention to secure parliamentary reform. In August, the MPU organised a mass rally to consider the most effective means of achieving a reform of the parliamentary system. Their star speaker was Henry Hunt. By the way, if you're enjoying this, please take a moment to click that like button just below. It really makes a huge difference to our ability to carry on making these videos. Henry Hunt, who had led the cheers outside Parliament for the 1817 petition, was a Bristol-born farmer who had ideas that were radical for their time. Equal rights, universal suffrage, parliamentary reform, and even an end to child labour. Imagine that. And the Tories were so worried about Hunt's influence that they intercepted his letters. It was a misunderstanding of one of the letters they intercepted that led to a terrible massacre. Joseph Johnson, secretary of the MPU, wrote to Hunt saying, Nothing but the greatest exertions can prevent an insurrection. I believe that Johnson saw Hunt as a calming force and this letter was a plea to Hunt to use his oratory to channel the crowd's energy towards a peaceful demonstration. The government read this letter and took it as evidence that an armed rising was being planned. Hunt actually foresaw this. He said, Our enemies will seek every opportunity by means of their sanguinary agents to incite a riot that they may have a pretense for spilling our blood. Even so, the Attorney General's legal advice was that troops shouldn't intervene unless an actual riot had started. That advice was ignored. So while the Manchester Patriotic Union was urging organising committees to observe cleanliness, sobriety, order and peace, and a prohibition of all weapons of offence or defence, the government was preparing to face down an armed uprising. 
Local magistrates, eager to show the workers who was in charge, sent 600 men of the 15th Hussars, several hundred infantrymen, a Royal Horse Artillery unit with two six-pounder guns, 400 men of the Cheshire Yeomanry, 400 special constables, and 120 cavalry of the Manchester and Salford Yeomanry. The Manchester and Salford Yeomanry were relatively inexperienced militia recruited from local shopkeepers and tradesmen, mostly publicans. What could possibly go wrong? Groups came on foot from across Lancashire to participate in the rally at St Peter's Field in Manchester. They carried banners demanding universal suffrage and an end to the ruinous corn laws. Included among them was a large number of women, dressed distinctively in white, the mark of female reform societies that had sprung up in the area. One banner survives to this day in the Middleton Public Library. It's the world's oldest political banner. It bears the words, liberty and fraternity. The meeting was observed by William Hulton, chairman of the city's magistrates. When Henry Hunt's oratory drew wild approval from the assembly, Hulton issued an arrest warrant for Hunt and the organisers. He instructed the Manchester Yeomanry to come to the scene. What followed was a fiasco. The cavalry pushed through the crowd until their horses were trapped. The riders lost their temper with the people around them and started slashing out with their sabres. Meanwhile, foot soldiers rushed into the crowd in an attempt to disperse it. This led to widespread panic and the protesters were driven in on themselves. All escape routes were blocked by infantry with bayonets fixed, driving people back into the melee and compounding the crush. Within 20 minutes, St Peter's Field was awash with blood. 18 people were killed, hundreds more suffered horrific injuries. The name Peterloo is a portmanteau of St Peter's Field, where the riot occurred, and Waterloo after the battle that had taken place four years earlier. While it gives the inaccurate impression of a pitched battle between two armies, in this event only one side was armed, it helped to evoke the bloodshed of that day. The term was coined by the Manchester Observer newspaper, which was forced to shut down in the aftermath of the massacre. In fact, many who covered the event were fined and imprisoned for sedition. Needless to say, the establishment was flexing its muscles. The organisers of the rally were placed under a arrest. The magistrates responsible for the slaughter were exonerated, and the Prince Regent wrote to thank them personally for keeping the peace. But what happened had made an imprint on the nation's consciousness. The government's murderous reaction to peaceful protest could not be erased from the national memory. Despite the arrests, Peterloo was still reported in the press. Commemorative items such as handkerchiefs, plates and medals were made. Percy Bysshe Shelley wrote The Mask of Anarchy, which embraced the principle of non-violent resistance. In the uneasy decade that followed Peterloo, calls for reform became unstoppable. In 1832, Hunt presented the very first petition in support of women's suffrage to Parliament. It wasn't a success, but the first blow had been struck. In the same year, the Great Reform Act expanded the voting base, giving cities proper representation and removed some of the rotten and boroughs. It wasn't democracy as we know it today, but it was a major step towards it. St Peter's Field is now known as St Peter's Square. It's bordered by Manchester Central Library and crisscrossed by tram lines. It's still the focus of demonstrations in the city. It will always be remembered for its role in pushing the United Kingdom towards the democracy it practices today. The events of Peterloo became a symbol for the struggle against state oppression. The cat was out of the bag. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to watch this video on the Chartist Uprising in Newport, when Democratic campaigners decided on a violent approach to achieving their goals. Thanks for watching and don't forget to click the thumbs up button below. I've been Luke Pearce and you've been watching the Radical History Channel.